I was set up so many years ago, um, 1983, I think, by just a, a group of Māori women that wanted to, to revive our art. And when you look at today, the revival is over. <laughs> and our queer, I could just imagine today, would be looking around today and just having a little tangy and, and thinking, gosh, it's just beautiful. Yesterday at the Pōhiri, when I had the cloak on for the rōpū, Ngāhiri o te ao, that's, uh, it doesn't just keep me warm, it's just all all the old people that have that aren't here anymore, that uh, some of them actually participated in the making of the kākahu that have moved on. Well, you've got them, plus a lot of others, family and friends that have passed on, but will be here with us.
my Kurawai is named Gerangi Mari. I wove it myself, my first attempt. I've always wanted to do it, but of course, as the old saying is, you have to work your talk. When yeah. you get older. One under here, get on go here, more get on to what's one under here, cut down here, king of fit when it all. fortunate that Marae Nui is a big marae and it has the amenities and everything else and the space to accommodate such a big flu like the marquee, you know, all under one roof. I'd like to reiterate the, the team who stretch from as far as the tickle to um, Portaka, which is this, the northern tip of this uh, Peninsula East Cape, we've had a strong, strong team. And the one thing that pulled us together was we made 300 of those kite for the Kite 800 Indigenous Peoples Conference down in South, the South Island. We wove 300 kits together and it took us five weeks, five and a half weeks. But having done that as a contract, um, which was the base to starting our fundraising for this hui. And we opened this hui with no debt. We've worked really hard to make sure that this was possible and we're doing it well. We're looking after our guests as best as we can. And um, I know everybody's enjoying the hui because you, you can feel a lovely spirit from all the people that have come all over to be with us. Harakiki, I'm just a learner. But the Kurawai, well, I guess I'm still a learner too. <laughs> I've been just doing Kurawai for about uh, maybe 10 years. Learned under Rangihinemutu, 
Um, she's our kaumatu from Te Awamarahi Marae. Yes, and we, she shared a lot of tongas and gifts with us, yeah, for the art of making koroai. At least I can say I can make a kete to look like a kete. <laughs> <laughs> well, these are the tools I use. A friend of mine, he made this for me. It's a shearing comb. Yeah. This is a shearing comb in its full form. And see, this is a different woods over here. And a friend of mine, he's a carpenter. He made this for me. It's like a, yeah, comb. Mm. It just gives an exact uh, measurement on the harakeke. Just position it on the... And pull it. And you finish it by using your hand. Run your fingers down there. See, four leaves, they're all the same width. Mm. Yeah. I joined Te Wananga o Aotearoa 1999 with Fire Edna Pahiwa, Emily Schuster's daughter, and uh, did my diploma with her, and I give every thanks to her. She's my idol. Yeah. <laughs> And she, she had to put up a lot of crap with me at the beginning of the year when I started with her and, yeah. And then um, come out of there and went straight into Wairiki Institute and become a tutor. Yeah, I've been tutoring for four years. You never notice how beautiful flax is. You know, you drive past it before you weaver and just think nothing of it. Now, gosh, you can near crash because it's like, oh, look at that beautiful flax. Or, oh, look at that beautiful flax. And, you know, you run up, have a look, and oh, which one, if it's mucca or the kitty flax. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of new designs are coming in um, of the kit. See, this is a flat bottom, but they poked it up. Like a, like a letter box on both ends, and now it made it a flat bottom, eh? Because it was only a two corner. It's a lock off here, and then we weave up here, and that gives it a lid. And I added the uh, bone so it didn't break because it breaks here. And um, this kit fits all because I put a um, made a bone so it fits everybody. I'm, I'm probably the only one can say that my kit fits everybody. <laughs> 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 tall as the tongue. to eat and have a little 
chat with someone and then by the time I finish that, I just come back and away I go again. I prepped, um, probably took me about two weeks and I prepped up enough fenu to make five kiti. Love it, love it. She was, I was sick and to go to bed last night. We got gassed out. <laughs> got a headache and then had to go out. And if it wasn't for that, I would have carried on. <laughs> My grandmother believed when, if you were old enough to contribute to making Māori weaving to sell to the tourists in Rotorua, you had to learn. So she made us, at 10 years old, sit down and learn to make pupu pew because that is what sold. Mm. Mum actually later finally tuned everything and did teach a lot, a lot of it to me, a lot more. So what, has, what started as a need to weave to sell became a love from what Mum had carried on and now it's actually a passion. It's, a, it's all about a sharing process for our weavers. You see, um, you know, although a lot of them are taught the basic weaving it's their creativity that their minds have just carried them on a journey that they start to share, they bring along and, and everyone shares in with the knowledge. But still have that, um, the roots of the traditional mahi that the queer started. I think that's important. So this is the beginning of a hat. <laughs> it's all practice. I grew up with it, so it's probably since I was about four or five. I really picked it up and started being brought up with my grandparents and my grandmother. So, yeah, all my life, basically. But it's, yeah, it's good because I'm able to share it with the students that are sitting around over here, see all their lovely work. Where I'm from, they just we used to have a lot of wines. They just asked me to come in. I've never, I told them I've never weaved before. But they said, oh, well, you can come. I've just done all the hard preparation, like harvest for the woman. And I just said, oh, I want to give it a go. So that was, that was me. Now I've been doing it for about three years now. And it's good. I really enjoy it. Yes! That's the beginning. That's the beginning. You put your first loop in. Like that. And what you're going to do is put your thumb up to that end there. And you're just going to turn that in. And while you're turning that in, you bring it into the... Oh, around, yeah. And turn, and turn, and turn. And then I'm going to pull this through here. And look. And there it is. Oh, look at it. <laughs> you know, our people, those years back, uh, did the clay pots with the stitch. It's my first kitty, and... Um, I've been taught by um, Kare over here, Tuahana, and um, enjoying it. It's been wonderful. I have been weaving full time since 2001. And I tutor, and I just love passing on my knowledge to anybody who likes to learn. It's uh, very therapeutic, and I think a lot of people will agree that it is it's therapeutic. My mother-in-law says, Karehe mutunga mai. There is no end to learning. So this is my first attempt at one of these, you see? Which um, I've called it Adrian's Lace Overweave. 
Nick looking. <laughs> I was trying to follow somebody else, but I think it's quite different. <laughs> Very modern. Yes, that was plaited inside, taken in the plait, and then taken up, and then you make an outer. Yeah, just an outer, just something different. Over. His shoes, yeah. Well, I can't put them on. I was just asking Kuro Chris how long he'd been weaving for, but he's forgotten. Oh, <laughs> honestly, have you forgotten? Well, I started it. After I retired, my wife borrowed the book from the library, Big Pendergrass, Kit Making for Beginners. And that's how I made my first kit entirely from the instructions in that book. So, so I've, I've been, I've been waiting for Lady over twenty, over twenty years. I've used in that are the commercial rip oh, dyes okay. that you just buy from the chemist, yeah. And I've faded them out, so I've used two different colours um, to create that look. And some copper wire and some beading. Yeah. Using traditional te techniques to, um, yeah, to just do some contemporary pieces. I actually took my cousin along to the Wananga in Gisborne because I didn't want her staying at home doing nothing. And the only courses that were left were weaving. And I was actually on a Te Reo Māori course at, this, at the time, so I thought when I'm finished, I'll go over and check it out, and I did, and spent three years there, completed a diploma. And then last year was at Toi Haukura in Gisborne. And there again this year, completing my degree, along with Fran. And awesome. Well, this is my first time weaving. Yeah, and I made this this morning. Because <laughs> I'm actually a painter. I, I paint, so this was a, this is a new experience for me. This whole this whole weaving, it's wonderful. Well, with copper, um, copper's a healing thing. It's a healing thing. Um, I've weaved kiti, um, harakehi kiti, um, but I've always played with wire since I was a young girl, so yeah, basically. These are natas, this is the snail's trail, and then you push it in. Because every now and then we have bumps in the road. And then at the end, very slowly like a snail. I went looking for you, didn't I? We end up with the nutter, the completion, slow and steady, because that's how everything works. If you do weaving slow and steady, you'll get it right. There's nothing about being in a rush of anything. And there's your nutter. <laughs> Kia ora. <laughs> I've been weaving. I started weaving when I was a child, but there was just simple green things, roto. Um, I've just started sort of in the last five years doing what I do now. Um, I'm making it my living. Yeah, it's now my living. This is actually about my moko. This whareke is about my moko. Yeah. Um, and the beginning of the whareke is, is like the inside of my lip, where the pink and the green meet each other. And so I'm feeling these needles going in me, and it feels like my lips have been split apart. So. And this is the, this represents the bleeding that, that's happening. This represents my the arms of my ancestors that are embracing me during this process, because my mind has to go to them to be able to handle the excruciating pain. So yeah, this this is 
a story about how I felt when I was getting my mōpō. And it'll be for my grandchildren. Um, this, this is my drawing for my there here, and up the top is uh, three carved woman's heads, and they're all upraised with their hair up above them. And then this is like their kākuhu coming down, but they're all, all interlinked with the design pattern. Mm. And we've got feathers in along the tops and also within the um, raranga here. Yeah. So it's about sisters and travelling and being um, separated, but no matter where you go in this, um, you're always linked. You know? Just about everything we do will have a kaupapa for it, so it always tells a story. Yeah. It's Candlewick, and uh, it's traditional weaving done on uh, contemporary materials. And the green feathers are actually goose feathers, a friend brought back from Hawaii and they dyed the, uh, the goose feathers green. So it's got a combination of turkey, hackle feathers, fowl feathers and uh, the paradise duck. And the idea is to try and get the colours of the swamp. And so the next one will be, the gr up the top will be the green and the poo gekko. It's a muka kete, and it's been dyed by the natural fibres. This is tanikaha, and that's the rarika. It's only one part of my pattern that's got the red. For some unknown reason, it's just that part and that part, and that's it. No, I put it off a pew pew pattern. And put it onto my graph paper, and yeah. I thought I'll do it here. That's just a little uh, traditional taneko kite. And I've got a little piece of pavo shell and a piece of duck feather on it. And of course it just makes it quite sweet. People use them for brooches or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, if you look in there, it's like, what do you think it is? Yeah. I spotted this pattern on one of the islands, Pacific Island. I said, right, I'm going to have you. So I just, yeah, it was a kete that I saw. Yes, you know, you admire their work and... Um, you like the pattern? Why not? Well, this is for Pew Pew. Like, like those ones I've got hanging up in that room over there, the old ones. So I'm just filling in time because I'm using it as a distractant because I don't want to do the other one. Ready? Four. <laughs> <laughs> Our band is playing up. Part of our push for the hui and our kaupapa was to 
promote our young people. We weren't worried about the elitists that, that are perfectionists way up the top, but rather our young, because after all, they're going to make sure that in time, Raranga continues on. I dream of you here beside me as we both walk down the aisles. We both walk down the aisles. Supremes, strategists of blues, when I am low. You gave me the tender, loving blow. You're tender. You know that I'll always cherish so. We've oh. already seen um, the sort of things. Um, you learn when you do Laranga, um, the um, behavioural change in the child. Um, they, they learn spiritual things about the things they can and cannot do while they're weaving. There's all sorts of aspects that you can hand on to those children. You can impart to them that your elders have given you. They actually learn to program themselves daily to make sure they achieve the goal that they've got set in mind. They actually set time frames for themselves, discipline themselves, learn how to prepare the flax before its usage, learn how to treat that flax. All those things those children have learned, the skills of learning that they've learned in the process of preparing their harakiki before it's woven. Because for me, that's the biggest job. It's not sitting there and plaiting. It's what comes first. Coming from a family of 12, <laughs> and this was abundant resource. <laughs> when we went to the marae, you didn't eat unless you made your kuno. So essentially, from the moment you could go, ah, 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 <laughs> you were given some. So, yeah. <laughs> There's nothing like the um, natural milk colour, you know, nothing like it. The power shells, and I just drilled holes in them, and so when it hangs, it'll, yeah. <laughs> and um, this here, I lived in China for 10 months, and I worked on this, and so I used silk, just as my signature, because of my experience in China and that comes from the silkworm so natural material beautiful to watch that oh, it was just fascinating watching the silkworm you know develop into the go into the cocoon and then how they make silk from one thread from every co one cocoon one thread so that, that there would be oh number of threads and so I thought well that's their true, true natural source, and this is our Māori true natural source, Harakeke, put them together. And silk goes beautiful with mocha. Mocha is like silk, I think. <laughs> the Māori silk. You might as well know, you know, the, uh, the flax is called Rereata. But I have two flax that I use all the time. One is called Atikuao, and this is Rereata. Belongs to uh, my mum, yeah, my auntie, my mother. When I first joined up, uh, we decided to have a muka wānanga. First of all, I chopped them all up. And then when I first made my uh, long one, I think the whole world knew. <laughs> so it was uh, just practice. But uh, my original tutor was uh, Fiddle Bailey. 
Oh. And, uh, yeah, that's the, was the stone end of me. That with the flax, it becomes part of your life. And, uh, do our little bit of what not. Lovely neighbours. Yeah. Uh, it relaxes you. It's, some people like knitting, some people like crocheting. Uh, I like going to the flax bush and uh, making the day out of that I create the cloak and it uh, uh, gives you great satisfaction. And, uh, it gives you a feeling of well-being. And I know for a fact that uh, this was part of my healing process. Uh, it, uh, I used it for a lot of things. Um, you get addicted to the smell of flax, it's beautiful. You get, yeah, you just must go to the flax bush, that's it, for me. Uh, yeah, it's not that hard. I'm not a weaver myself. I didn't get the gift, but my children had it. And my mother was over here. Give the putzahariki in their hands. That's how they learned from their daddies. And two of them, three of them, all of them. I'm so proud of them. I'm talking about these tees. We've got a mermaid coming out from our corner. We've got a mermaid coming out from our corner for tomorrow night. It's been picked up and just moving forward and in leaps and bounds from, um, what is it, about 20, 24 years ago to a bunch of, say, 10, 10 queer. And to, today we had 300 plus registered for this hui. So that's a major. And it's had that strong, um, strong presence to carry on.
キャロンを冷やもう開けとぬわつわらな冷やかたに冷やつくわ気がフェチュー